Good evening. This is the meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education, and it is Thursday, October 20th, 2016. And may I have the attendance, please? Uh, Mrs. Bealy? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Mrs. Hobbs? Here. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? We do have um, we do have one adjustment to the agenda. There will be uh, additional appointments, 6.2.5, which will be middle school co-curricular appointments. Five point oh. Are there any? Is there anyone in the public who wishes to speak on an agenda item this evening? If so. Please come to the podium, state your name and address. Uh, good evening, my name is Larry Hartwell and I live at 9 Puritan Drive in Scarborough. Uh, I am supportive of schools, I'm very proud of our town, our facilities and our staff here. I'm also very proud of my board members, you guys put in an inordinate amount of time those of us who wander into some of your, your meetings have a better appreciation than, than others do on that. So um, I wanted to talk about the teacher contract, which is what our discussion point is, is today. Um, I think many of the citizens watching the proceedings from home were surprised. Um, the contract represents the largest contract by the school and by the, 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 the whole town. Um, it may represent 15 to say 25 million dollars in annual salaries and benefit costs. Now these costs are locked in with a three-year contract. I'd ask the meeting about how much the, the contract would cost and we heard that it was a half a percent COLA, one and a half percent COLA, and three percent COLA. I think six steps were going to be added and that health insurance would be paid at 80 to 100 percent. Uh, so the question remains, does this represent a half a million dollars or a million dollar increase or what, what does it represent? Uh, we were told that these details would be presented at a later meeting, which is, is today. Um, then there was a vote held on the contract and it was unanimous. Um, one has to ask the question, who amongst you knew what the total cost for what you had voted? If everyone did not know, why not wait and hear tonight's presentation? Would you approve a contract to buy a bus without knowing its cost? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hartwell. Anyone else who wishes to speak on an agenda item? Seeing none, we will close the public session. 6.0, new business, 6.1. Meeting minutes of October 6, 2016. Is there a motion? Move so approval is printed. Second, so we can discuss. Discussion? I have an. Who is I have a correction I'd like to make to the meeting minutes of to, to, to October 6. Um, as stated um, in our last meeting, the COLA was described in our uh, teacher contract as 0.5% in year one, 1.5% in year two, and 3% in year three. The actual COLA is 0.5% in year one, 1% in year two, and 1.5% in year three. This original figures cited, these original figures cited were calculated each year going back to the expired contract of 2015-2016 salary table. So I make a motion to amend the October 6, 2016 school board meeting minutes as follows. Replace the COLA of the 0.5% in year one, the 1.5% in year two, and the 3% in year three to the actual COLA of 0.5% in year one, 
1% in year two, and 1.5% in year three. Second. Is there a second? Jack? Yes. Okay. Any discussion on the amendment? Any questions? All in favor of the amendment? Seven plus one. Thank you. So now we go back to the first. No, we don't. So we move approval then mm -hmm. to of the minutes as the amended. Of the motion. Of the, motion. Of the, I'm sorry, of the minutes as amended. Second. Thank you. Question? All in favor? Seven plus, plus oh, one. I'm absent. Sorry. Oh, okay. Seven. Okay, let's see. 6.2, appointments. 6.2.1, middle school ESL teacher. Yes. Um, Tobin Hag Haglin has been nominated to fill this position created by a resignation. Mrs. Haglin received her Bachelor of Arts degree in French from Roanoke College. She earned her master's degree in deaf education from New York University and her English as a second language certification through the University of Southern Maine. Ms. Heglin has been a teacher of the deaf and ELL English language learner in several schools in the greater Portland area for over 25 years, including a one-year temporary position at Scarborough High School in the 2009-2010 school year. Ms. Heglin will be placed on step 26 of the Bachelor's Plus 30 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Tobin Heglin as middle school ESL teacher. Move approval. Second. Any questions? Very good. All in favor? Seven plus one. Six point two two is a Wentworth co or the Wentworth co curricular positions. Various school staff have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded from the general fund. The recommendation is to appoint the Wentworth co curricular positions as presented in agenda item six point two point two. Move approval. Second. Second. Questions? All in favor? Seven plus one. 6.2.3, NEASC Steering Committee Chairs. Lauren Bornstein and David O'Connor have been nominated to fill these two positions that will be funded from the general fund. The recommendation is to uh, appoint Lauren Bornstein and David O'Connor as the NEASC Steering uh, Co-Chairs. Bornstein, I'm sorry. Move approval. Second. Yes. Would you explain for the public what that is, please? Sure. So our high school is working um, towards NEASC accreditation and that requires a lot of um, additional time and effort being put in above and beyond the contractual day. So the co-chairs co um, of the steering committee are responsible for organizing, leading, coordinating all of the aspects of the NEASC self-study in collaboration with other steering committee members and with the principal, the co-chairs will determine um, all of the individual responsibilities throughout the three phases of the NEASC self-study. In the three phases, um, I have lots of detail here. Phase one is organizing the self-study and this includes um, contacting uh, staff person, the staff person, the CPSS staff person who's assigned to the school, distributing preference sheets, making standards committee assignments, selecting co-chairs and co-chairs and co of the st each individual standard committees, which there's seven, developing a self-study schedule, timeline after meeting with the CPSS staff liaison, order and, um, order and administer the Endicott opinion surveys to all staff, select and assign parents, students, and support staff members to appropriate standards committees. They will also apprise central office professional staff to their roles in the self-study. Um, they assign steering committee members as liaisons to each of those standing committees or standards committees. They give uh, due consideration to establishing a small editing committee that will work with each of the standards committees in the development of each of the standards reports. They prepare the budget um, in collaboration with the principal and they make preliminary plans for housing the visiting committee. That's all in phase one. <laughs> the second phase is processing the self-study reports. Um, 
and in this phase, they write the school and community summary. They monitor evidence gathering of each standard committee, um, and they check for quality and quantity of evidence to ensure that we're on the right track and collecting all the things we're supposed to. They monitor analysis um, of the evidence by each individual standard committee. They monitor the development of the standards committee reports. They review each standard report, the narrative and the executive summaries. They distribute standards reports to professional staff seeking comments and questions. They establish protocol for presentations of all the reports at faculty meetings. And I'm sure they will also be coordinating um, presentations for this committee throughout the process. They um, conduct formal vote using an established protocol. They make final edits to the standard reports. They work with the teachers to identify critical strengths and areas of need. They obtain two and five year targeted plans for improvement for the leadership team and um, include this in the self study as well. And they organize all of the reports in preparation for the on site visit in phase two. Thank you. <clears throat> in phase three, they are preparing for the actual visit that will occur. So there's uh, a panel presentation that they have to plan for. There's a reception of the team on a Sunday that they have to plan for. They finalize all the hotels and meals and transportation <coughs> arrangements. They meet with the chair and assistant chair of the visiting committee to review all the components of the on-site visit. They mail materials to members of the visiting committee. They prepare lists of teachers, um, individual daily schedules. They provide all of the materials for the workroom at the school and the hotel of the self-study documents, including materials identified in the self-study guides to be made available in the workroom, computers, printers, projectors, um, anything that they need, paper clips, pens, clerical supplies. Um, they prepare a list of school activities that will be occurring during the on-site visit so that the visiting members can um, engage with our community. They select student guides. They prepare a list of rooms and times for small group meetings with the visiting committee based on the schedule prepared by the chair. They will also prepare emergency information to be sent to the visiting committee. They invite all of the students to be shadowed and their parents and guardians um, to the Sunday reception when the team first comes. They invite all other appropriate personnel, local <coughs> dignitaries, and guests to the Sunday reception. They make name tags for visiting committee members, professionals, and support staff. And they also ensure professional and support staff other system personnel, parents, students, and community members are available to meet with the members of the visiting communities based on the schedule of the visit. So a few responsibilities. <laughs> I just want to say I think it's a miracle we got anyone to sign up for this. So <laughs> thank you to everyone who did. Yeah, and as someone who went through this twice at a college of 700 people, the, the co-chairs regularly were given full um, release from all teaching responsibilities for the year. They didn't teach a single class. So the fact that someone is willing to do this for this amount of money in addition to a very heavy teaching load is, you know, really just volunteerism. And so I second what Kelly has to say. It's a hard job. Uh, is, is, are all three phases this next year? The, the current school year? No, they, the they happen over the next two years. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Are we all in favor? Or do we have the motion? We already have the motion. We have the motion. Seven. Plus one. Yeah. All right. Um, 6.24 is... Uh, Various school staff have been nominated to fill these positions that will be, this is the NEAS committee chairs. Um, so each of those seven substandard committees have chairs that lead and coordinate that individual standard work. So various staff members have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded through the general fund. The recommendation is to appoint the NEAS committee chairs as presented in the agenda item 6.2.4. Move of approval. Second. Any questions? I just have a quick yes. question. So yes. each of these individuals will be in charge of that standard and report yes. directly to the co-chairs? And the principal. And also Monique is really involved in that work. I yes. just have one thing. I'm, I'm participating in, on one of the committees and underneath each committee sub-chair there, there's also a group of other individuals. So there are other teachers and support staff mm -hmm. and everybody else who's still involved in this and they're doing certain parts to each standard. 
then. So the standards are broken down even further <coughs> into substandards. So it's not just, <laughs> but they're overseeing that particular standard. So it's a lot of people that are really doing mm -hmm. a lot of extra things to make this happen. And us. those extra participants are, are then not being paid. Mm -hmm. The work is being done during the late start times yeah. for the There school. is a whole group of other sure. Yep. Anyone else? Very good. All in favor? Seven plus <laughs> one. Six point two point five. Uh, 6.2.5 middle school co-curricular appointments. Various school staff and community members have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded from the general fund. The recommendation is to appoint middle school co-curricular appointments as presented in agenda item 6.2.5. Move approval. Second. Any questions on this item? The uh, yearbook position, is that to be filled soon or? That's at the one on there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We're at the middle school. Sorry. I'll hold that thought. Anyone else? All in favor? 7.1. 7 plus 1. Okay. And 7.0, the workshop. Finally, 7.1, the analysis of the 2016 2019. Scarborough Board of Education and the Scarborough Education Association's Collective Bargaining Agreement. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go up to the podium. Yep. Donna, can I just say something before sure. we start the workshop? Um, I just want to respond to Mr. Hartwell's comment because I watched the town council meeting last night too where you had similar concerns. And I just want to let people know that when the school board is entering into negotiations, before we even start negotiating, we have executive sessions, which you'll see at the end of our agendas, that we're adjourning to executive session to discuss whichever the contract is. So before we start negotiating, we meet with the full board. We talk about financial parameters. We talk about goals for the contract. While we're negotiating, we meet again with the board. How's it going? Here's an update. Here's what we're thinking. Before the contract is ratified, we're in executive session again, and we're costing everything out. So we do know what's in the contract. We do know what it costs. I'll take responsibility for that for last week because Donna wasn't here because I knew that this presentation was happening. I think there's a value in quality analysis rather than paste um, and trying to just spill a bunch of facts about it last time when I knew that this was coming coming for this meeting. Mm -hmm. So I take responsibility for that, not having the details there, but I do want you to know that we absolutely know what's in the contract and what it costs. So. I appreciate it. Jackie? And uh, to follow up with that, I had the data and I met with the superintendent and the s assistant superintendent a week before the meeting and went over the data and the superintendent being new to the position asked if I would remove some of that data and allow her to make a presentation because she wanted to have the opportunity to analyze the entire contract and its total effect on the total school district. So even though I had the data at the time, I did not present it because we have a new superintendent who wants to take the leadership role as she should to represent all that the school department and the Board of Education is doing on behalf of our students and our staff. And uh, I think that shows true leadership and supported that at the time and support it now. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, and I, I do have to say it was probably a rookie mistake. Um, and as I promised some of our community members the other day, it won't be my last one, but I always promise to, uh, to confess and do better. Um, and. Uh, so hopefully tonight all of the questions will be answered um, and you'll have a really clear understanding of uh, the, the value of this contract and what it means for our community. So tonight we will discuss um, just that. What is the value of our teachers? How is education changing? Um, what's going on nationally and locally in terms of teacher shortages? 
I'm sure if you've been reading any any newsprint anywhere, um, you've heard something about uh, what's on the horizon in terms of education and teacher shortages. Uh, we'll then take a deep dive into our teachers by the numbers, and then we'll look at why this collective bargaining agreement is good for our kids, why it's good for our community, and why it's good for our teachers. And then we will have a, um, a thorough collective uh, analysis of the collective bargaining agreement, and then questions and comments at the end. And I just want to say thank you to um, all of our teachers and district leaders who are here tonight in support of this conversation. That makes me feel really good that you're here, so thank you. So starting, I do want to take the opportunity to thank our school board for recognizing how important and valuable our teachers are. Our school board is elected to represent the community and has a direct responsibility to the taxpayers in negotiating a contract that is fair and equitable to the community and the staff members who serve our students. Our school board uh, unanimously voted, their unanimous vote clearly displays the level of respect that you have for our teachers um, and the dedication, so thank you for that. I believe that this contract is all of those things I mentioned earlier and that it aligns both with our vision and our values. So thank you to the school board. So when we talk about the value of a teacher, um, in preparation for tonight I had been looking at tons and tons of information about you know what is the most impactful thing that um, in, in terms of student achievement and there are hund literally hundreds of studies that have shown the only factor that can create student achievement is a knowledgeable skillful teacher and when I think about the work uh, the qualities of our teachers um, many things come to mind our teachers are motivated they're responsible they're good communicators they have content knowledge engaging personalities they provide excellent rapport and support for our students, um, among many, many other things. But uh, the reality is, and you're going to hear me say this over and over again, it's not about programs, it's not about stuff, it's, it's about teachers. They're the ones who are really going to ensure that our kids are prepared for the future. So when I think about how education has changed over the past few years, and I think about also what we're hearing in the media about teacher not only attraction to the field but retention, um, I can't help but, but think about how much things have changed. Not, not in the last 100 years, not in the last 20 years, in the last 5 or 10 years education has changed dramatically. Um, and so what it is that we all remember in terms of those really good qualities that our teachers had that made them so influential on our life, our teachers today still have to have all of that. But they also have to be data analysts. They also have to be curriculum writers. They also have to be really skilled communicators. And you know, with the advent of email, on call almost 24 hours a day in some cases, so um, I found this quote, and I'll, I'll tweak it a little bit to fit our class size, but I thought, you know, as I think across the fields, um, professional fields, if a doctor, a lawyer, or a dentist had 20 people in their office at one time, all of whom had different needs, some of whom didn't want to be there, and were causing trouble, and the doctor, lawyer, or dentist without assistance had to treat all of them with professional excellence for nine months, then he might have some conception of the classroom teacher's job. Um, and that's just like a brief window of what our teachers juggle on a daily basis and striving to meet the needs of our students. Um, I also think about a, a recent quote from our president, Barack Obama. Uh, he said, teachers matter. So instead of bashing them or defending the status quo, let's offer teachers a deal. Give them the resources to keep to keep good teachers on the job and reward the best ones. In return, grant schools flexibility to teach with creativity and passion, to stop teaching to the test, and to replace teachers who, who just aren't helping kids to learn. Um, and so education is shifting again for us. As much as it has changed and as much as it changed with No Child Left Behind, we now have the Every Student Succeeds Act on the horizon, and it's shifting again. But I feel that it's shifting in the right direction. We're, um, 
moving away from holding that one test, that state test, as the end-all, be-all of our measurement of success, and we're looking at the whole child. We're thinking about social-emotional learning, and we're thinking about how we address that. We're thinking about preparing kids for a future that doesn't exist yet, which means that we're thinking about adaptive skills. Um, this also means that these are new skills, this is new knowledge, this is new information that our teachers need. Um, so thinking about how we invest in them so that they stay motivated and can stay committed to this work is so critical. Having a competitive contract, I think, is a, is a step in the right direction for that. So I have to admit, as I was reviewing this presentation today, um, I found myself sort of sweating at the idea of what's happening in our country and what the future of education could look like. Um, this comes from an Education Week article, which was really eye-opening for me and actually has some fascinating data that you can play around with. Um, this shows the teacher supply and demand projections um, for the next few years, the next nine or years or so. And what you see there in the orange line, that is the new higher demand. And so that big dip, we all remember what was happening then between 2009 and 2013. And now you see that the demand is going up again. Um, so the shortage this year alone, and then the red line shows the estimated supply of teachers, right, over time. Um, so obviously not the kind of gap we want to see as we think about the future of education. Nationally, this school year alone, there was a 60,000 um, teacher shortage across the country with higher levels of shortages um, in terms of math teachers, science teachers, and ESL teachers. And so when I read that, I think again about the future of Scarborough and about the future for our kids and what they need in terms of teachers. So we have this increase in demand. The good news is part of this increase in demand is that some, some districts are starting to get more stable financially and back on their feet. So they're able to hire back some of those teachers they had to let go in 2009, 2010 school year. Um, that means that we're able to reduce class sizes in some communities. But uh, this also means that in some of the cities in our country, they're, they're having an even harder time finding high quality teachers to fill those roles. Teacher preparation enrollments have fallen 35% nationwide in the last five years alone. And so when we think about who's going to fill this demand, we have, to, we have to look at that pipeline and see who's coming our way. And increasingly, less and less people, less and less students are, leaving, are, are coming into education majors. And we're going to look at that a little deeper in just a few minutes. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time thinking about like, well, what are some of the factors that are going to attract people to our profession, not even, you know, thinking about Scarborough just yet, but just nationally. Um, and we know that professional development, high quality professional development, more protected time for teachers to co-labor and truly collaborate around some of the increasing needs of our students is essential. So when we get into what does this collective bargaining agreement offer for our teachers, um, you're going to see that there's an increase in the amount of collaboration um, and professional learning time that they have with one another. And that's something we should all be really proud of. So what does the future hold for public education? This is a quick bar graph just to take a look at the percent of people majoring in education. So in 1971, 11%. In 1990, 10%. Um, uh, in 2010, 11%. And here we are today in 2016, 4.2% um, of people majoring in education. My slides are all twisted here. Okay. So um, this is not new news. I'm sure you've heard about these waves of teacher shortages before, and some might be compelled to say, oh, well, you know, here, here we go again. This is the same old news, right? Um, and you're right about that, because even as recent as 1999, or as far away, depending how old you are, um, John Marrow, who did a PBS series on education, reported that we had plenty of teachers who were entering, who were um, majoring in education and graduating with degrees in education, but only 30% of them never made it to the classroom. And of the teachers who do make it to the classroom, 30% of them were leaving within the first five years. 
And if you're like me, you're wondering why. <laughs> Our teachers are saying they know. <laughs> um, if I was a mind reader, I would know that, that the reason behind this is the added pressures. You know, we have this plate and this role of responsibility for our teachers and we just keep adding more and more to it. Meanwhile, still trying to use the same exact structure, the same amount of hours in the day, the kids are there the same amount of days, but asking our teachers to do more and asking them to do high level um, in-depth data analysis around this work as well. And also increasing the accountability. Um, and putting more and more responsibility on their shoulders. When the reality is we know that school doesn't create all of the gaps that are happening in our country in terms of education and opportunity, it just happens to be where they show up. Um, and so that's a stressful environment. I don't know about you, but as I think about it, I'm stressed about that. And I know that many of our teachers are, and in fact, that's why they're choosing to leave the profession. Um, the amount of pay, the compensation for the amount of work just is out of balance. And in 2016, there was a national survey done by the NEA that revealed the number of students who will stay in the major, um, in the major in education, and this is the lowest point that it has reached in 45 years, 4.2%. So this isn't the same old, same old. This is something really new. It's a crisis and it's a concern. So you might think, well, that's the national level. This is Maine. Things are different here. I hear that sometimes <laughs> since I've been here. Um, in Maine alone, there's an estimated 5% of current teachers that will be eligible for retirement and, um, in 2018, by 2018. In Scarborough, 12.5% of our teachers are currently eligible for retirement. 12.5%. We have 310 teachers. Another 6% are within five years of the normal retirement age. And so depending when you came on board in Maine, um, anyone with 25 years of service may retire, but those under the age of 60 would receive, receive a reduced benefit to that. And this is going to be important for you to remember as we talk about our teachers by the numbers. So 25 years, um, you can retire. If you're 60, you pay a penalty or you get less of your benefit. Um, but if you're over 60, and in some cases, depending on when you were brought on board, it could be 62 or 65. So I remind you again, the only way to improve student achievement is through that classroom teacher. Um, and this was a, a study that was put together by Harry Wong, and he looked at all of these different factors that can improve student achievement. And I just pulled out a couple of quotes um, because it, like, and no matter what I was reading, this kept coming up. The only factor that increased student achievement was the significance of the teacher. Studies have shown that teacher preparation is one of the strongest predictors of student achievement. Studies have shown that teacher expertise is the single most important factor in determining student achievement. So the bottom line clearly is we can have good schools without good teachers. Um, and as we talk about and think about how education has shifted and changed, I think about the fact that our kids can pick up their smartphone and find content and find answers in a matter of seconds. So the idea that the teacher is this keeper of knowledge, this conveyor of information, is really obsolete. Strong teachers don't teach content. Google has content. Strong teachers connect learning in ways that inspire kids to learn more and to strive for greatness. And that's a quote by Eric Jensen, who is um, a, a well-known educator in, in our field, or I'm sorry, researcher in our field of education. So again, going back to what is the role of the teacher? How has it changed? How quickly has it changed? How unstable is it? And how, how unstable is it going to continue to be as the world is changing so rapidly around us? How do we prepare our teachers? How do we make sure that they're supported so they stay motivated and committed to our kids? So as we start to look at our teachers by the numbers, we have 310 teachers in the Scarborough Public Schools. And I'm saying teachers, um, but I should define what I mean by teachers. And uh, this contract covers our classroom teachers, our special education classroom teachers, our academic support teachers who serve in an interventionist role, our nurses, our librarians, our OTs, our PTs, 
our social workers, our speech therapists, our behavioral specialists or therapists, um, our consulting teachers, our ESL, English Second Language Learners teachers, our GATES teachers, which are gifted and talented teachers. Am I forgetting anyone? <laughs> guidance, and guidance as well, thank you. Um, so we have 310 teachers defined in that way, and I'll continue to call them by just this general group of teachers, but lots of skilled professionals. 79 males, 231 females, 199 of our teachers has a, has a master's degree or higher. Um, and just a point of clarification, all teachers must have at least a bachelor's degree in order to enter and become certified. So 64% um, of our teachers have at least a master's degree. That's exciting when I think about the time they spend with our kids each day. Our teacher turnover rate is about, last year was about 5.6%. We had uh, 20 folks who left the district. Uh, three of them retired, 17 left for other districts, other careers, or moved away and didn't tell us what they were doing. <laughs> so I'm really curious about career phases, and I've um, recently read a book that cites some research that divides the teacher's career in these phases. So to frame our context and, be, and to think about who our teachers are and where they are and what they need from us in order to feel supported um, and to, to reach high levels of efficacy, I've been thinking a lot about this. And I thought it was interesting to see where are our teachers in terms of career phases. So new teachers, zero to three, high levels of commitment, need lots of support um, and are feeling challenged and um, we have 18. 18 teachers in that zero to three. When we look at um, phase four to seven, this is where teachers start to really identify or build their, um, their teacher identity and feel efficacy in the classroom. We have 23 teachers. In phase eight to 15, um, this is where teachers are managing changes and starting to experience some growing tensions. Might have had a superintendent or three, um, a principal or two. Uh, maybe uh, ready looking for something different to do in their career to stay fresh and revitalized. We need to be cognizant of that. 16 to 23, this is where a lot of our staff are experiencing work-life transitions. This is also where um, challenges to stay motivated and committed start to occur. And um, I don't know if any teachers in the audience are recognizing that, but it's a, it's a normal part of our of any career cycle. This happens just to be talking specifically about teachers. This is also the sweet spot. This is where our most valuable teachers, and I don't want to say most valuable, but our teachers are at a point in their career where they have reached that efficacy, but they also can become really strong teacher leaders. Not that it doesn't happen at other phases, but just in this study, that's what was found. Um, and so really knowing how to nurture that and how to supplement their workload in ways that allow them to explore some of these options is really important. Um, in phase 24 to 30, this is where it becomes a little more challenging sometimes for folks to sustain motivation. And then after 31 years, um, it becomes increasingly so. Now, this does not mean this is for everyone. This is what they found in this study. Um, but I just wanted to use this as a context to see where, where does our sta staff break out in terms of the years of experience. You'll notice that we have a lot of staff um, with a lot of experience. That's a huge asset to our children, but that also means we have to be really mindful about what they might be thinking about in terms of their next steps and what that would mean for us in terms of teacher turnover. So here in Scarborough, we're working really hard to use an adult-centered learning model to inform student-centered learning. And having information like this and learning more about what people need at each phase in their career is going to help us ensure that we have these two really um, healthy cycles of learning happening on a continual basis. So here's that same information, just more in a pictorial form. Um, again, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the, the more experience, the higher up you go on this bar chart. So 31 plus is at the top, 24 to 30, 16 to 23, 18 to 15, 4 to 7, 0 to 3. And so um, 
it's really good to have a healthy mix of people at all of these different career phases because as we just talked about, they bring different skills and talents and knowledge and experience to the table, but that also means that they require different types of support. So as we're talking about human capital, it's really important for everyone to understand that salaries, benefits, wages, that's 75% of our budget. Um, I think we all know and understand the value of investing in your people. Um, this reminds me of how critical that is because they are not only our most impactful asset when it comes to student achievement, but it's the bulk of our budget. It's where we're investing the most of our resources. So we want to make sure we have a really healthy plan for recruiting talented folks to our district, but more importantly, that we're retaining them and that they want to stay here and they want to be a part of this community and this, um, this collaborative team, which I like to think of as a family. So 75% of our budget on average goes to our teachers, our staff, our wages, our benefits. So why is this collective bargaining agreement good for our kids? I'll sound like a broken record, but research shows that effective teachers are the most important factor in contributing to student achievement. We talk about this all the time when we think about the fact that our teachers spend more time each day with our children than their parents do. Um, they have such a power of influence, and so making sure that we have effective teachers is critically important to ensuring that our students are successful and that when they leave us, um, they have choice and opportunity at their fingertips. On the other side of that, when you think about the impact of an ineffective teacher, an ineffective teacher can affect a student's learning for years, but if you have two ineffective teachers, um, in subsequent years, it can damage your whole entire academic career. Um, and that's a really powerful counter to what I've been saying, but it sort of reinforces how, how important our teachers are and how we need to value them. So why is this good for our community? Well, as I was saying, human resources are, needs to be our priority. Um, and I loved this quote by Stephen Covey, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. So thinking about our people first will always be um, our best strategy moving forward. And thinking about um, this study here, Ferguson found that in a large scale study that every, in a large scale study that every additional dollar spent on raising teacher quality netted greater uh, student achievement gains. And when I think about student achievement, we're not just talking about test scores, right? Remember, we're talking about the whole child and thinking about um, their social-emotional skills, thinking about those adaptive skills, their civic engagement, the whole entire child. More valuable than any other resource. So why is this collective bargaining good for our teachers? Um, in this three-year collective bargaining agreement, there are um, new salary tables that have been adjusted to provide a more, a more competitive wage. There's a cost of living adjustment, and I'll explain why that's important to think about as we dig into the analysis of 0.5 or a half percent in year one, one percent in year two, and a one and a half percent in year three. Six steps were added that encouraged longevity. Again, thinking about that retention. How do we ensure that not only we're attracting talent, but that we're keeping talent? Um, the, stipend scale has, the stipend scale has been added to the contract, and this really supports that idea of developing our teacher leaders and compensating them fairly for the work that they do above and beyond the contractual day. Uh, we also, our teachers also gain six additional hours of collaboration and professional learning time through this contract. Um, what's not new, but is still a benefit to our teachers and included in this contract is the health benefits package at 80% of the Choice Plus plan. Not 100%. Not 100%. So in this slide, um, I actually want to show you this slide first. 
So in this slide, I start by just looking at the COLA, the parity, which I'll explain, and the salary. So you can see the percent change over time. Um, and what I've done through the next few slides, you'll see that there's an FY16 slide that reminds us of what was the expiring contract? Where were our teachers on the expiring contract? And then we have the projected impact for this school year, next school year, and the following school year. So you should have a really clear understanding of what is this costing us as a community over time? Um, and then you should also be asking yourself, is this a fair and balanced contract for our teachers? Is it attractive for us to um, bring folks into the district but also keep folks in the district? So the COLA is the cost of living adjustment. The parity is um, the work that was done by the negotiation group was to look at our salary scale comparative to four other districts um, in the area. And what we're trying to say is, you know, do we have the capacity within our current scale to attract new talent and to retain talent? And what they did was looked at um, South Portland, RSU 21, which is Kennebunk, Arundel, Kennebunkport. Tell me, Kennebunk I'm still learning all those numbers. Um, Yarmouth and Falmouth. And they averaged the difference. So what were we offering in our expiring contract and what were they offering in their FY17 contract? And that difference after average was then divided over the three years. And so in this case, um, on this chart, we're calling that parity. So it's a third of the average dif difference. And of course, this is different at every step in the contract. Um, and this is where the language gets really complex, so um, I'll try to go slow with it, but when I'm talking about the contract, there's steps that go down based on your years of experience, and there's lanes that go across based on your level of education. So it's a really complex matrix, um, and what this bargaining unit did was um, they worked to level off those steps, uh, both going down and also looking at the um, the compensation going across for the increased levels of education. So it starts with bachelor's, bachelor's plus 15, bachelor's plus 30, master's, master's plus 15, master's plus 30. Um, and I debated whether to put the slide in here or not, but it would have been so tiny um, that I just thought I would visually act it out for you. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. So. Um, this is how the math works out. Now, what's important is to see that our expiring contract in FY16, our teachers did get a 2.5% cost of living adjustment. This is what we were trying to do um, to, to close that compensation gap comparative to other districts. I think it would be 100 years before we actually get there in this way. So um, this new contract gives a little boost in that by adding this a third of a parity throughout three years. What you'll see is that it doesn't quite get us there, but it brings us closer. Um, and so you see the percent change from FY15 to 16 is that 4.31%. It looks like a big jump from 16 to 17, um, but what's important to know here is that seven new positions have been added, and if those seven positions were not added, through the budget process, it would have been a 4.14% increase. Those seven positions that were added were five new positions at the high school. This is, remember, a two-year phase-in of a new schedule that's going to allow us to offer more choice and access to our students once that schedule is fully in place. It also includes a new STEM teacher at Wentworth. So now our students at, at Wentworth Intermediate School have STEM all year long um, where they didn't have that before. And it also it adds a bridge teacher at the middle school. So trying to help students transition and catch them early in order to ensure that they have success. So those are the seven new positions. And then throughout the three years of the contract, they're included in the calculations that we have here. Um, it's also important to know that these are projections staff turnover, um, staff may retire, staff may choose to leave for some of the reasons we talked about earlier. So these are just projections and we'll see what that looks like with our, our previous contract and we'll compare that to where we're going. So this talks just specifically around the impact of the new salaries, the COLA and that parity that's been added.
So going back here, this is where um, I try to illustrate the total impact of the contract for you through this analysis. Um, and so what you have here are the health benefits. You have the, the stipends that we mentioned, um, which are not new. They're just, uh, this is the first time that the language was actually negotiated in the contract. They existed before, um, but it wasn't written into the contract the way it is now. The, and tuition reimbursement. That's available for our staff to continue growing and evolving in their professional practice and knowledge. The salaries and then the total cost and the percent change now that all of those things, the full benefits of the contract are added there. So um, I won't read those numbers to you, but I'll just give us a few minutes to kind of digest that and take it in. And the other thing, um, again, just a reminder, there is a note at the bottom, but this is including those seven new positions over the three years of the contract. So it does pull them out for you in FY17 so you could see had we not invested in our programs and in our students in that way, it would have been a 4.94% increase. But this is something we all agreed upon during the last budget cycle. So this is where we get into the analysis of trying to establish a competitive wage. Um, what I've done here, what we've done here, is taken a first year teacher with just a bachelor's degree on step one and shown you what would they have made in Scarborough based on the expired contract, and then what would they make if they were a first year teacher in Falmouth. What's the difference? So if, if a teacher chose or had the option between coming to Scarborough or going to Falmouth, they would make $2,534 more based on our expired contract in Falmouth than they would here. And then we do the same for each of the other comparative districts that we use throughout this presentation. So RSU 21, remember that's Kennebunk, Kennebunkport, and Arundel, 35,343 if they were to choose to go to that district as opposed to ours, that's $379 less than ours. Um, I don't want to interrupt your flow because it's awesome, but um, just for the sake of com being complete and accurate, we actually added another district, which was, I can't remember the RSU, but it was North Yarmouth and Cumberland as well. So Greeley. 51. 51. 51. 51. We also use them when we were negotiating the salary. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry to throw off your chart, but there is one more. Were they averaged into the parity that was calculated? Yes. Okay. Thank you for that correction. Um, so I'll update this before I share that on the website. This will all be available on our website and that will be added. Thank you. Um, so you can see there, I, I tried to color code it. Um, anything that was showing a difference is in red and anything that showed um, an increase or equal is, is in green. So there, you can see there's only one area that is green and that would be um, an FY18 if you were an RS20, RS20. U21, you would have made $87 more than our t if you came to us in FY18. Um, and the question marks are uh, for the, is to show the districts who don't have, their contract expires before FY19. So we don't know that figure. Um, they're not currently negotiating, but they will be. And I'll show that again in other ways. So my point in sharing this with you is to let, you, let the public know that we're also you know, trying, not working with a full data set when we're trying to make these comparisons. So we sit down to negotiate a three-year contract. We try to do our homework and compare to other districts, but we only have the information that we have. Um, and so we went through and averaged it out so that you could see what that would look like over the term of the contract, just to give you a sense, like, are we, does this new contract bring us competitive wages? And like I said, it doesn't get us all the way there, but it does get us closer. Julie, just to clarify, um, your last statement that said if you were in RSU 21, you would be making $87 more. It's the opposite way. Mm -hmm. Scarborough is Oh, less. I'm sorry. Yes. Right. We, right. In, in Scarborough, you'd be making $87 more. Thank you for clarifying that. That's why it takes a village, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, Remember that part about admitting my mistakes? I'm reminded daily. Um, so what we're going to do for the next few slides is we're going to take a journey 
with three different teachers. We're going to look at a newly hired teacher um, who we're pretending came to us in FY16 under the expired contract so you could see what would they make in FY16 under the expired collective bargaining agreement and then we're going to follow them over the three years of this new contract. Um, and then we're also taking one of those middle of the road teachers um, in the sweet spot of their career that has a master's degree um, with 15 years of experience. What does their um, salary look like over the next three years? And we'll do the same with one of our very experienced teachers who has a master's plus 30 and 25 years of experience. So here's what it would look like in FY16. Remember, this is the expired contract. And what I've added to this slide um, for clarification is when each of the other districts that I'm using here in this analysis, when their, when their current collective bargaining agreement would have expired. So you'll notice that Yarmouth is on the same cycle as us. They just negotiated this contract as we were negotiating ours. Um, the others expire before we get to the end of our agreement. Um, so again here, uh, what I've done is average the difference from what our teachers would be earning um, at each step in their career and what they would earn if they were in those other districts. So teacher one, remember this is step one, just a bachelor's. Um, teacher two is step 16 ma with a master's degree and teacher three would be step 26 with a master's plus 30. I think you can see those numbers pretty well, right? So I won't read them all to you. Okay, so now we're in this year, FY17, with our new collective bargaining agreement. Again, notice the average differences. Now teacher one is on step two with the bachelor's degree. Teacher two is now on step 17, still has a, a master's degree. And teacher three is on step 27 with a master's plus 30. I did not incorporate any lane changes because that would make this very complex, but know that that does happen. Um, our teachers are always learning and growing, so um, in this case I kept it a little more constant, as few variables as possible. But you can see we're still in the red. The average difference, you're still making less on average, um, on the cumulative average, than you are in our neighboring districts. And depending where you are on the scale, the gap is wider, um, dependent upon how many steps the other district may have. So our same three teachers, um, and we're following this analysis through FY18, but Falmouth's contract has now expired. So we don't have numbers for FY18, and that's where you see the question marks, um, but you're still seeing the average dif difference from the three remaining districts. And what we did, um, just for, uh, just for your viewing experience is we brought in the expiring contract of Falmouth so you could see like if they got a zero raise with a zero cost of living adjustment, um, no, no adjustments in their scale at all, they stayed with their old contract, this is what it would look like there and there's the differences as it averages out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. If they got nothing, yes, we would still, our teachers would still be earning less at each point of those careers, in their careers. And so here, our first teacher is now on step three, our second teacher is now on step 18, and our third teacher is now on step 28 with the same levels of education. And so in FY19, we have a few more unknowns. Um, so again, this is to show you now all three districts contracts would be, would have expired, but we brought in their existing or the expiring contract figures just for the sake of completing this chart. Um, so if uh, they had no raises or no cost of living adjustments, no adjustments in their, in their scales at all, um, this is what that would play out to be. We thought about possibly using the cost of living adjustment our teachers um, bargained for this time around, but I thought that would be really misleading and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to do that, so. So, the question I asked is, is this normal? Um, and a, just a little point of suggestion, don't Google images, is this normal? Not a good idea. <laughs> um, so instead, I looked at the past, what's happening now, and what could happen in the future. 
Um, and we're going to take an analysis of our expired contract, what we projected salaries would be, um, and this is uh, just the salary analysis, and then what it actually turned out to be. So you could get a sense of what were the percent in increases in the past contract. Um, and so I'll walk us through this. At, we start going back to FY13. We budgeted um, that amount there, $15,452,429. I'm not going to read all the numbers. Um, just one example. And then the actual expenditure was $15,323,438. Um, so there was actually a cost savings there due to turnover in, in personnel, which we know is going to happen every year, of $128,000. Um, and then we look at what was budgeted in FY15 comparative to what was budgeted in FY14. And this is where you see the budget change year to year. And so the change from FY14 budget to what we budgeted in FY, um, I'm sorry, FY13 budget to what we budgeted in FY15, it's a 3.93% increase. Um, that's what we were projecting as the increase. But then when you go down to the next row, you see the actual change. So it actually ended up being a 4.45% increase. And it's also important, note at the bottom, what was the, um, the cost of living adjustment in the old contract? And that was a 1.5% in year 1, um, a 2% in year 2, and a 2.5% in year 3. And so it continues to follow that pattern. So we look at what was budgeted in FY14, what was budgeted in FY15, what's the percent change projected, and then what's the actual change. So we projected a change of 4.36%. The actual change was 4.3%. Same thing for the subsequent year. Um, the percent change that was projected is 4.17. The actual change was 4.31%. So just to give you a sense of the moving target that we're working with here when we try to project out numbers over the next three years. Um, so I promise that the numbers I'm projecting for this new contract are going to change um, based on our staff turnover, which we know is going to happen based on the pure numbers um, of teachers that we have with really high levels of experience, right? Remembering we have 55 teachers who've been teaching in our district for 25 years or more. Um, I think we have almost 80 teachers who are 60 or older. So it's really whenever they feel like they're ready, they could choose to, to retire. Um, not to mention folks who want to leave our district for any other reason. So you know those changes are going to happen um, and we're just trying to create a picture. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> All right, and so now we're looking at the new collective bargaining agreement. Um, and again, for an anchor, you have FY16 there, what was budgeted, and then you have what was actually um, expended. And you can see that what we budgeted um, and what we expended, there's a difference of 48701 in um, unaccessed funds, if you will. I don't want to say savings, but what's the word I'm supposed to say, Kate? instead of savings. <laughs> she had a good way to explain it earlier. <laughs> um, and then if you look at FY17, we have, you know, what's budgeted and that now that we have this agreement, what the actual projection is. Again, this increase includes the seven new positions. If they were not included, it would be that 4.14 percent. Um, but including these seven new positions, it's a six 0.55% um, increase, and then they're included as we project for FY18, and they're included as we project for FY19. Yes? Point of clarification. If we had not added the longevity steps, if you look at the chart, the first chart that Julie's talking about where it says as the three positions Step two, step uh, teacher one, teacher two. Go to teacher three with the step 27. If we had not added the extra steps, that person would have been receiving 
719 instead of 74, 744. And if you extend that out over the three years, they fall further behind other districts. That's the reason that the longevity steps were added for our most experienced teachers. And different districts do it in different ways. Some districts give them the cost of living adjustment and then they give them a longevity stipend on top of that. And there's like a range, um, and this varies with each collective bargaining um, agreement. Some, you know, some, it might be a couple thousand in some districts, but as you have more and more experience, that, that stipend for longevity increases. So there's different ways to do it. Um, this is the way our district chose to do it to compensate for that experience. Thank you for pointing that out, Jackie. Well, I, th I think it's important that, you know, people can have a copy of the contract, they can look it up, they have this data that they can compare it with, but if you just go and look at, at step 25 across the board as opposed to step 31, you'll see where our folks would have been stopped, so to speak, and that's more than 15% more than of our employees. Yes, it is. Um, and I think Jackie's point is a good point because I tried to really simplify this so that it would be something that could present well to the public, but also be really accurate and super transparent about what um, you know. You know what we know. Um, the only thing that that you don't necessarily maybe fully understand right now is the com is the overall complexity of this work. Um, it, through the negotiations all the way to you know planning the budget each and every year. There are things that we know for certain and we can be really um, accurate about and there's other things that we have to use historical analysis and, um, and, and estimated projections in order to calculate. But um, the one thing I hope you know for certain from this presentation is that our teachers are worth every single penny and that they alone are the number one factor that's going to ensure that our students get the high quality education that they need and that they deserve. And so I just want to thank our teachers who are here and also our teachers who I know would be here if they could be here. Um, thank you so much for coming and giving more time out of your day after working a really hard long day. So give it up for our teachers. I would like, I would like to point out one more item uh, negotiated in the previous contract when we negotiated the health care benefit, we saved the district somewhere around $300,000. And that annually, that wasn't just a one-time deal. That is continuous because of the way that the health care benefit is set up in Scarborough. We were the first district to ever ask our employees to participate, in other words, 20%. We're now the first district that negotiated uh, a health care benefit that benefits everybody and saves the district money. Thank you. Yes, Kelly. Um, I just want to say thank you. This is so worth the wait. I mean, um, we intuitively know all this, and some of it we know factually, obviously, how well our students do when we have engaged, prepared, educated teachers on our staff. But um, thank you for backing it up with science and charts. I think that's very helpful. And I'm not always the most popular person in a room, especially in executive sessions, when I say, if we don't pay the teachers, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. Because we know that that's the way to do it. And if we're investing in the future, if we're investing in the school department like we want to, we have to pay the teachers. Because if they leave or if they never come, and we're out of business. So thank you for all of this. It's really fantastic. Great. Well, speaking strictly personally, if I had my way across the country, teachers would be the highest paid people, you know, in any industry. They certainly deserve to be and, you know, do far more important work than I think most of us do. Um, trying to understand and maybe sort of anticipate questions that the public might have, I do have two clarifying questions for you. The first is, can you explain why it is that that projected increase drops from 6.55 down to the, to the mid-fours for the two years afterwards? 
Sure. It, it has to do with the parity that's added in the second year, um, and what we're looking at is the increase from from FY16 to FY17. So as the as we raise the salaries in FY, I'm sorry, FY17, then we're it's less of an impact in FY18 and then 19 is my understanding of it. Kate can probably explain that a little more better. Come on over, Kate. <clears throat> I think the biggest difference is to go back to those seven positions because what we found was, was difficult in, in creating these trajectories from one year to the next is that if you add staff, you're not talking apples to apples anymore. You're not talking about simply the impact of the bargaining agreement. You're talking about the impact of the bargaining agreement, the COLA, the change of whatever the salary table might look like, plus new people. So if you're talking about a total cost, you have to factor those new people in somewhere. And so what we chose to do was to say, okay, in year one, we've got the impact of the contract, but we also have these new guys, and they're going to be with us, we certainly hope, for the next three years. So we need to put them in as a baseline. So that's why you have a jump from 16 to 17, but then it's a smoother uh, progression in the second uh, three years of the contract. Great. Does that make Thanks. sense? Yeah. And the second question, which may or may not involve you, um, a say. question that I hear a lot of people ask is how these neighboring communities get chosen and what would happen if we chose different neighboring communities. Right. Always a question. How do you choose your cohort? In this case, I believe that the group that was brought together um, was suggested within the negotiations team based on the population and valuation and size of the school districts and the amenities of those communities. So essentially we looked at, I, I say we, I looked at it after they did the work. Um, we looked at communities who had similar size, similar valuation, um, and uh, demographics. Demographic. the population, and, and as well the median income. Yeah, the of, valuation. Mm -hmm. So it was essentially looking at, um, at financial factors um, the prosperity of the community and also the coastal communities that have some of the same amenities that we do and the size of the school districts. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. <coughs> Thank you for this. Um, I find it interesting that, and I appreciate the interest in this because, and I understand it, um, but what I, I find interesting year after year is that these are college educated professionals that we're talking about with 64% of them having masters, at least a master's degree. And that teacher is making $75,000 if they've been here a while. Um, <laughs> a really long 20 time. 20 years. <laughs> yeah. like um, and so, life. you know, I've seen people um, in Mr. Hanley's blog, he's, he's sort of pulled out and extracted the top 10 teachers and what they make. But I think pulling out the top 10 te the highest paid teachers is a disservice in that that's 3% of our 310 teachers. So if you look at 3% of our professionals in the state of Maine, they're making well into the six figures. So we're getting a deal here and we appreciate them and I, I feel like the constant spotlight on our teachers and the questioning is counterproductive, not only for our teachers and our students ultimately, but for our community. So thank you to the teachers that came. Mm -hmm. appreciate you. And what I would add to that, Jody, is literally the future of our country depends on, on these people. And so, you know, constantly putting their work or um, devaluing their work on a regular basis, that weighs on a person. I mean, wake up every day and come to work with the intent of changing lives and making a difference for 31 years, 33 years. We have some teachers who've been here for over 40 years doing this work day in and day out when every time you turn on the TV, every time you turn on the radio, someone's telling you how it's not good enough or you're not working hard when they're working harder than ever 
for many of our for many of our teachers the job they signed up for 40 years ago does not exist right so we talk about preparing our kids for jobs that don't exist our teachers are doing jobs that didn't exist 40 years ago and the type of work that they're being asked to do and the knowledge and skills that they need to be successful and, and I think about the seniors in high school or the juniors in high school who are looking at colleges and wondering what do I want to be when I grow up well when you hear the constant negativity mm -hmm. and um, banter education doesn't come high on the list because it seems like there must be something wrong. And so that perpetuates the problem. And these teachers are doing incredible things. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to be appreciative that we're getting a bargain. We're getting a deal. It's plain and simple. Carrie? Yeah, I wanted to kind of piggyback on what you both were saying and just that when teachers sign up for the job of being teachers, they know that they are going to have a transparent salary system. You know that, and that the whole town is going to know exactly what you make. But it doesn't make it, knowing that doesn't make it less demoralizing to have it be criticized and questioned. So I just, again, I want to thank you as well. Great presentation. And I would like to know, with the statistics that some people are throwing at us in the media, what is the average salary of a person in Scarborough with a master's degree who is not a teacher? Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you right now, I have a niece who is 32 years old, just got her license as a clinical social worker, does not live in Scarborough. She lives in Manhattan, has a baby, <laughs> has a two-bedroom apartment, and is supporting herself master's degree from Columbia. So there's a person, she's had her license a year and a half, and she's making more money than probably three of our teachers together. Mm -hmm. It's just not, r I'm glad for my niece, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really will continue to fight for the teachers, especially those who teach our children in Scarborough. Anyone else? Lucy, did you have your hand up? No. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that excellent analysis, Ms. Kuckenberger. You, you did much better than I would have done. <laughs> Don't agree with that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you did much better than I would have. I can't even figure out how to get the PowerPoint to change slides. 8.0 is adjournment. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Seven plus one, we are adjourned. Now, it's the